They say I'm just a conspiracy theorist, and all my seemingly wise words are just conspiracy theories. Why should anyone listen to a conspiracy theorist? Why should anyone listen to me? Welcome to Conspiracism. If you've been paying attention to social media, or you happen to be part of a particular marginalised group, you'll doubtless be aware of the whole turf is a slur debate slash debacle. TDLR, there are some so-called feminists who want to exclude trans women from being, well, women. The position they hold to is often described as trans-exclusionary radical feminism. Radical feminism because it belongs to a kind of feminism which advocates a reordering of society in which male supremacy is eliminated, which is, you have to admit, a pretty radical departure from the status quo. And holders of the no trans woman allowed position are considered to be trans exclusionary because, well, they exclude trans people from their analysis. Now some of you will be in the process of closing the tab on this video because of the sudden appearance of social justice warrior content in what is meant to be a simple video series dealing with conspiracy theory theory the academic discussion of conspiracy theory. But I have a point here. Trans-exclusionary radical feminists, or TERFs as they don't like to be called, consider the whole TERF thing a slur. They'd rather be called gender-critical theorists because, well, reasons. If you want a deep dive into that, you should be watching ContraPoints. But don't tab away just yet. You see, TERFs don't like being called TERFs because even though it's a perfectly adequate descriptor of their view, it's also a term which has to some extent been weaponized by trans-inclusive feminists. Calling someone a TERF is apparently the equivalent of calling someone a witch. Oh, and apologies to actual witches I know, and it turns out I know a great deal, but for many people, calling someone a witch is basically thinking they ought to be burnt on a pyre. Which, strangely enough, brings me back to conspiracy theory theory. You see, some people think that calling theories about conspiracies, conspiracy theories, or people who theorize about conspiracies, conspiracy theorists, means we are indulging in slurs which effectively shut down debate about secretive plots in our policies. And to a certain extent, they're right. Conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists are terms which have been, to some extent, weaponized by the powerful. So, let's take a look. To my mind, the best discussion of how the labels conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists have been used to dismiss or exclude people from reasonable debate is a paper by my friends and colleagues, Jenna Husting and Martin Orr. As they argue, conspiracy theorists is part of the machinery of interaction, and is a label which performs work no matter how true, false, or conspiracy related some claim turns out to be. Basically, if you label someone as a conspiracy theorist, then you're automatically putting whatever they say into a box labeled conspiracy theories. That is, no matter how true, false, or conspiracy related their claim happens to be, if I refer to them as a conspiracy theorist, I'm effectively saying they and their beliefs don't belong in a reasonable conversation. Husting and Orr refer to this as dangerous machinery, and it's a fantastic analysis of the way in which you're just a conspiracy theorist has been used by the powerful to exclude critiques of power in society. Now admittedly I'm biased, I love both Jenna and Marty. Marty and I have written several pieces together, and Jenna, Marty and I have at least one paper in preparation. I even made the pilgrimage to Boise, Idaho to see them, and believe me, that's saying something, especially since I set out from Auckland, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Jenna and Marty convincingly make the case the label conspiracy theorists casts a long shadow over our discourse one which makes it hard to separate legitimate concerns from you're just crazy, yo. And they're not the only ones. We find similar arguments in the work of Jerome Harabam and Steph Authors, 
who argue that the pejorative use of conspiracy theorists by conspiracy theory theorists effectively means the views of conspiracy theorists are dismissed before we have a chance to even analyse them, whilst Pe Michael Busser and Peter Knight argue that the idea we can produce value-neutral research on conspiracy theory is nonsense if we work with definitions which bake in the irrationality of such theories. Which is to say, quite a lot of people think the terms conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists are used in really problematic ways. So case closed, right? We shouldn't use these terms. Onwards, upwards, spiralling towards enlightenment, right? Well, no. For one thing, I'd have to change the name of the series. And for another, even if we accept that the labels conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists are problematic, there are still consequences to keep in mind if we avoid using them. Husting and Orr still talk about conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theories, as do I. So let's look at why we might want to keep the terms even if we admit they have negative implications. Joven Byford, for example, distinguishes between legitimate analyses of secrecy and collusion in politics and these things we call conspiracy theories. He argues that it's important to maintain that distinction even though he does hand-wavingly admit it is hard to do. Why does Byford need to distinguish between legitimate analyses of secrecy and conspiracy theories? Because he thinks conspiracy theories are a mere rhetorical device we should resist taking seriously. Byford thinks that conspiracy theorising generally produces bad theories, and so we don't need to engage with conspiracy theories on the evidence. He then wants us to avoid using the terms when talking about legitimate worries about secrecy and collusion in politics. That is, conspiracy theories are associated with conspiracy theorists, and we know conspiracy theorists are generally not the most rational people, right? It's useful then to compare Byford and his argument with the work of Lance de Harvin Smith. He also thinks we should distinguish between conspiracy theories and legitimate analyses of secrecy. But his motivation and Byford's could not be more different. You see, de Harvin Smith is a proponent of a very particular set of 9-11 conspiracy theories, the inside job thesis. You know, the claim 9-11 was committed by elements within the US likely the government. De Harvin Smith recognises his beliefs are usually pejoratively labelled as conspiracy theories, and thus he wants to avoid being labelled a conspiracy theorist. So in order to get people to take things like the inside job seriously, he wants, or at least wanted, we'll come back to this, people to talk about state crimes against democracy. SCADS. SCADs are explanations of events of momentous importance which happen to blame big conspiracies. The difference between a SCAD and a conspiracy theory is that SCADs are credible and conspiracy theories are apparently not. Now the kind of theories to Harvin Smith considers to be exemplars of SCADs are things like the inside job and the October surprise thesis. The claim that US presidential candidate Ronald Reagan delayed the release of US hostages in Iran in order to help his election chances. Yes, Hitchens, I am still disappointed in you even in death. Now apologies to those who champion both the inside job and October surprise theories, but they are not obviously true, nor is the evidence in support of them more credible than their rivals. Basically, de Harvin Smith doesn't want his pet theories to be labelled conspiracy theories, nor himself to be called a conspiracy theorist. But the solution, calling these theories scads instead, doesn't solve the worry at hand. The solution, as I'm going to be saying time and time and time again, is evidence, evidence, and more evidence. Now, de Harvin Smith's other motivation for preferring the scads terminology is more interesting and provokes more sympathy from me. He is worried that the people who commit such state crimes against democracy are using the conspiracy theory label 
to counter legitimate criticisms of conspiracy, and thus make us lose focus on the sometimes, perhaps often, conspiratorial activity of people in positions of influence. Both Byford and de Harvin Smith are appealing to the fact that the labels conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist are treated suspiciously by most people, or at least that is what we are told. There is work like that of Mike Wood which suggests that the label doesn't quite have the negative connotations many of us conspiracy theory theorists think. Now my friend and colleague Lee Basham is rather pleased by this because from his experience giving talks in North America, people are nonplussed if you refer to something as a conspiracy theory. They just want to know if it's true. I am a little more circumspect, if only because my experience seems to show that sometimes the label hinders discussion, and sometimes it doesn't. Certainly in my home of Aotearoa, New Zealand, a former Prime Minister, John Key, tried to deflect criticism of dirty politics coming from his office by saying, that's just a conspiracy theory. That led to the public saying, you're right it is, but is it true? But I've also spent time in Europe, and even in countries wracked with a long history of conspiracy, sometimes the label conspiracy theory is sufficient to shut down debate. But it seems that maybe the kind of worries that motivate both Byford and de Harvin Smith are not fixed, which, if anyone had ever bothered to consult a linguist, would be obvious. Labels can and do change meaning over time. In some places, and at some times, conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theory have had pejorative implications, which happen to shut down debate. You know, in the same way that describing someone as a socialist or a communist in the US is political shorthand for both traitor and weirdo. But outside the US, socialist and communist aren't unacceptable labels for political beliefs. Both Byford and de Harvin Smith invoke the spectre of conspiracism, which infects decent talk about dastardly plots without really thinking through the consequences of giving up on the labels conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist. Which brings me to David Cody, a Tasmanian-based philosopher who I know quite well. That is, well enough to have been invited to contribute a chapter to a book he edited and well enough that I invited him to contribute a chapter to a book I edited. So the following criticism comes from a place of care, not rivalry. In a recent piece, Cody wrote, To characterise a belief as a conspiracy theory is to imply it's false. More than that, it implies people who accept that belief, or want to investigate whether it's true, are irrational. So far, so good. He goes on to then argue that the term conspiracy theory serves to function like the term heresy did in medieval Europe. It is used to stigmatise and thus marginalise people who have beliefs that are considered out of bounds. Indeed, he states, If, as I believe, the treatment of those labelled as conspiracy theorists in our culture is analogous to the treatment of those labelled as heretics in medieval Europe, then the role of psychologists and social scientists in this treatment is analogous to that of the Inquisition. That's quite a bold claim, but in some sense he's correct. Much of the work in the social sciences, for example, treats conspiracy theory as a class of belief which is inherently false, as I argued in a previous video. Cody then goes on to say, When professional psychologists imply these terms, it can constitute a form of gaslighting, that is, a manipulation of people into doubting their own sanity. Strong stuff, and I think a bit too strong. Gaslighting is a case where someone quite deliberately makes you doubt your own sanity, in order to manipulate you. And whilst I certainly think a lot of work in social psychology is wrong-headed, especially the way in which said work characterises conspiracy theories as prima facie false or inherently suspicious, I don't think they do this deliberately to play with us. There's a difference between being sincerely wrong and deliberately obstructive and comparing disagreement in conspiracy theory theory with actual gaslighting is just inappropriate, to be frank. Moreover, 
I just don't agree that we should avoid using the terms conspiracy theory or conspiracy theorist. For one thing, changing natural language is difficult, even for philosophers. We can stipulate usage all day, or tell people to avoid using terms, like valid for sound, for example, but it's society that dictates what words mean, not academic elites like David and me. For another thing, and this is the more important part, the issue is that even if conspiracy theory theorists stop using labels like conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist, it's still going to be the case that members of other disciplines, like social psychology for example, which bears the brunt of most of David's ire, will continue to use the terms. Thus we have a problem. If we agree to David's proposal, then we are going to be in the position whereby some of us will be trying to critique the literature whilst not being able to use the language of that literature. Meanwhile, the social scientists who use the label in a pejorative fashion will continue to produce pejorative work we will find hard to critique. What we need to do is what I have been arguing for quite some time. We need to reclaim conspiracy theory. After all, it is much better to persuade our academic colleagues that the definitions they use are flimsy at worst, and inconsistent at best, than it is to tell them to stop trying to make fetch happen. Yes, it's true people in power might not come along for the ride, but at least they won't be able to point towards experts who agree with them. Plus the arrogance of thinking that if we don't use the terms, the issues associated with them will go away only serves to make us look distant and unconnected to the societies we are meant to be the critics and conscience of. Finally, there's a certain weirdness to this proposal. If we avoid talk of conspiracy theories, doesn't that just mean we'll end up shifting the pejorative onto the label conspiracy instead? That would make the problem worse, not better. Everyone agrees conspiracies occur. But Cody's solution would likely see that word saddled with heretical connotations. Rather than suspiciously saying, that sounds like a conspiracy theory, people would suspiciously say, you're not suggesting a conspiracy, are you? And the thing is, Cody knows this. He argues that, one bad effect of these terms is that they contribute to a political environment in which it's easy for conspiracy to thrive at the expense of openness. But avoiding the terms, rather than rescuing them, makes it all the easier for people to continue to get away with labelling views they don't like as conspiracy theories, which is a really effective way to cover up actual conspiracies. Giving up on the term just makes it more powerful when it's used or abused. Now I've been a bit unfair to Lance de Harvin Smith in all of this, because at least he's come to think the SCAD's nomenclature isn't the best of ideas after all. In a paper with Matthew T. Witt, de Harvin Smith claims the SCAD label is not fit for purpose if we are trying to unify political leaders and their constituents around a common understanding of what constitutes a faction-based threat to popular control of government, which is a fancy way to say that if we want people to take claims of conspiracy seriously, the scared terminology won't do the job. Instead, de Harvin Smith and Witt think a better approach is to drop attempts to relabel conspiracy theories and instead develop a framework for investigating claims of conspiracy independently. I have some thoughts on this coming out in a book really quite soon, which we will doubtless talk about in due course. But it's interesting as to why de Harvin Smith has given up on scans. It seems the problems he associated with the label conspiracy theory ended up being a problem for scans as well. That is, if you think conspiracy theory is an example of a bad label, then you probably don't want a new label which also suffers from the same tragic consequences. Now I started with talk of TERFs, and I'm going to end with talk of TERFs. TERFs don't like being called TERFs, unless they are self-identifying to other gender-critical theorists, because they consider the label to be a slur. Now any label can be used as a slur. I'm a philosopher. But people who don't like me have described my views as typical of a philosopher, because hey, 
philosophers aren't a valued commodity at this moment in time. But turf is wonderfully descriptive of a particular position. It does, after all, describe a form of radical feminism that excludes trans people. In the same respect, conspiracy theory describes that the theory in question is about a conspiracy. Sure, it has negative implications in some places and amongst some people, but surely what we need to do is work to fix that, rather than shrug our shoulders and walk away. Let's not turf out conspiracy theory just yet. Sorry, that was an awful pun. I'll fetch my coat. I am now contractually obliged to say please like and subscribe, oh and ring that notification bell, and visit my Patreon. Making videos is costly both in time and effort, and a few dollars a month helps cover those costs. And there's rewards for those of you who do want to push some monies my way. I'm going to be providing scripts, behind the scenes materials, and shout outs for those people who like that kind of thing. Details in the credits and the video description. So, until next time, be seeing you.